Lisa Harnish at Certification Partners. We're here for this month's CIW webinar. We're going to be talking today about HTML5, separating fact from fiction. We're here with uh, Dr. James Stanger and Stephen Schneider, and they're going to be talking about our today's topic. James, you want to say hello? You bet. Hello, everybody. And how you doing, Stephen? Hello, oh, James. Doing pretty good. Hi, everybody. Hi, Lisa. Good morning. Well, we're excited to be here, folks, talking about uh, HTML5 and uh, to give some uh, tips about uh, this particularly interesting way to go about designing. So, Lisa, uh, shall we go ahead and get going? We can get going. Um, let me cover a couple of housekeeping things with everyone. Um, to all of our attendees out there, you are in listen-only mode. I have you muted by default. Um, I want to point out that there is a questions panel in your GoToWebinar panel that you can ask questions. I'll monitor that. If I can answer the question, if it's something I know, I'll go ahead and answer that for you. If not, I'll save that question for James to address verbally by the end of our session, if not before the end. Um, I also want to point out that we are recording this webinar. We will post that recording on our website when we're finished. And we will also email out a PDF of our slide presentation to all of our attendees. Uh, probably sometime later on this week, either today or tomorrow or the next day. All right, James. Okay, Stephen. Well, let's go ahead and, and uh, look over the agenda real quick. First, a uh, little blurb about what CIW is for anybody who's new uh, to what we do here. And then we're going to talk about HTML5, what it can do, and then get a little into it and start looking at some code and see what it does and answer any questions that you have. We also have a bit of an announcement at the end of uh, this uh, of this webcast. First, a little bit about uh, about us. Stephen Schneider, expert instructor and instructional designer, an author, formerly a tenured professor. Stephen, tell us a bit more about uh, about yourself and what you've been up to over the past few years. Well, James, uh, th thanks for that lavish uh, uh, in intro there. You're you're way oh. too kind with, with words. Um, quite the words. Quite the words. This guy's guy the real deal. He's the BZ. I'm, I'm telling you. So, but, uh, so but, but yeah, I've i I've, I've spent a number of years actually in the classroom, uh, both doing a little bit of secondary, but mostly post secondary uh, education. Um, I've worked with the CIW program for, gosh, uh, seven years now. Yes, has to um, be. Yeah, and, and yeah, uh, so good stuff. And and um, you know, uh, through that, I get to do a lot of traveling and, and, and meeting with educators and students and administrators, um, you know, internationally, and and really help to to get the right curriculum, the uh, right implementation plan in place, and and then uh, James worked with you on a on a writing project for O'Reilly uh, Publishing for LBI, and and uh, that's 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 about me. Uh, yeah, we, uh, at CIW it would be nowhere near successful uh, uh, as it is if we didn't have Stephen Schneider uh, working with people worldwide, uh, helping implement the program. It's uh, it's exciting to work with Stephen. Um, I'm James Stanger. I'm President, Chief Certification Architect. I've been an author for years. I've I've done a lot of uh, blogging over the years. Uh, worked as a consultant in various ways in terms of security and also open source. Uh, I've worked with the Linux Professional Institute, Symantec, IBM, and others to help create certifications and uh, programs for them. So I'm happy to be engaged HTML5. What is CIW? It's a skills-based education program. And we take a holistic approach. We provide courses and certification programs about web development, design, and security. Our whole idea. In being vendor neutral, we put people on a lifelong learning path, not a vendor's product treadmill. Uh, we take the best vendor applications as judged by industry, from open source to proprietary applications by Microsoft, Adobe, and others. We take a competency and skills-based approach to education. And we have a globally accepted program. Uh, about a million courses and exams delivered worldwide over the last 10 or so years, um, over 65,000 certified individuals, um, a number that grows every day. It's a program that's created by web experts, a community of professionals and instructors and technologists get together. We do have a global presence that's designed by education experts as well, from universities, community colleges, high, uh, high schools, and learning centers. The whole idea is the IW program. Now, 
who uses CIW? We uh, have learning centers worldwide, Firebrand, YAT in Egypt. Uh, we have uh, many in Japan who teaches, teach this. LaSalle Learning, for example, in Florida uh, uh, use this. Uh, just a moment here. I'm <coughs> experiencing some sort of issue with my connectivity here. There we go. It's just worldwide uh, and further education colleges worldwide use CIW. And uh, um, so we've got an advisory council. And the reason for this is, is we want to get a cross-section of industry and government and nonprofit organizations to help us make CIW what it is. So we talk to people such as the University of the West of Scotland, uh, New Hebei University, the University of Phoenix, but also Google Express to make, and Western Governors University to make CIW what it is. Well, as a result, CIW has received quite a bit of recognition. For example, internet.com named CIW as a top developer search, one of the top five certifications that puts web developers on the fast track. And we came in at number three right behind Microsoft and uh, Oregon. Find the in-demand skill sets and the proven salary performance, CIW uh, is the way to go. And you can read this full article, and we'll be sending you, by the way, a PDF government endorsements going on. Uh, E-Skills and City and Guilds in England, uh, the Department of Defense 8570 initiative in the United States has listed it. Uh, the Scottish Qualifications Authority also. These are all examples of CIW's uh, acceptance in the industry and by government uh, worldwide. Well, let's see, Stephen, I think uh, I may have gotten over that. Uh, gone through that in record time. Record time, James. Record time. <laughs> record time. <laughs> well, let's, let's start separating some facts from fiction. I bet, I bet yeah? you do that in your sleep at night, too. <laughs> I think well, I think so. I think this, you know, the sad thing might be I might do it as, as the many people on this webcast are sleeping. That, that just might be the problem, you know. Uh, this uh, smiling face here in the blue shirt. Now, let's talk here about uh, HTML5, what it can really do, because there are a whole bunch of things that it can do that we're not really going to be talking about today. And that's but, it uh, exactly, you know, James. Yeah, HTML5 yeah. will do a lot of things. And you know, when you just pull up the reference guide, one of the first things is, oh my gosh, you know, do I have to learn all this stuff? And and so yeah. there are a lot of things that we won't even be able to address. But what we're hoping to do today is basically provide a general overview of the capabilities of HTML5 and, and, and what we should be doing as practitioners as far as right. you know implementing. That's right. That's right. And I think when it comes to implementing, what you're going to see is we're going to take a look at the, the the DTD, for example, which is really difficult this time, isn't it? In, it is. In HTML5. Very complicated. I mean, yeah, so that's going to be tough. But So let's take a look at an overview. We've got a few bullet points here that just barely you know, sketch what HTML5 really can do. The first one, uh, I was going to write video in a flash, but somebody on a, on a website already stole the idea for me, from me. You know, I was gonna, video in a flash. <laughs> yeah, Excellent. right. So I, I, yeah, can't do that. So tell us about why video is so hip in HTML5. Well, sure. Well, we're going to actually talk about it in just a just a just a few more minutes um, with some slides about it. But but there's a lot of questions about um, video and video accessibility from yeah. the different devices that we have connecting to the internet today and, and how we actually use that media. Um, uh, access is always an important issue. Speed is an important issue. And what about search engine That's optimization, right. James? That's right. So, That's so good right. stuff coming up. So we got good stuff coming up there, and what you can do with HTML5 is you can grab video without a plug-in, which is a big deal for desktops and mobile devices. We can manipulate images on the fly using the Canvas element. We can do some offline storage and um, applications, which is a lot of fun, very interesting. Uh, a lot of new forms are available to you in HTML5. We can do some geolocation. I felt like writing geocaching there, but no, it's geolocation there with, uh, with HTML5. Uh, and then doing interesting things like running JavaScript in the background, so you're almost, it's not really multitasking, but it's something like that with web workers. So those are some of the things that HTML5 can do. And you're going to get some links later on that uh, allow you to do a lot of research, very targeted research, save you a lot of time. When it comes to HTML5, YouTube, for example, um, is using a lot of HTML5 these days. There's just one simple example of sites that are, have gone directly to it. Uh, another site which is near and dear to my heart is CBS's Star Trek page. You can go where no one has gone before with HTML5 and 
in this case, classic Star Trek videos, which are, happen to be my favorite. Sorry, I'm a moss back. So these are examples of how industry is going in and grabbing HTML5 big time. And one thing I wanted to point out, Stephen, you noticed at the BPA there were some of the people who were doing the competition who had been already adopting quite a bit of HTML5. Is that right? There were. And, uh, well, I've yeah. got just one more to add to your list of examples right now of, okay, cool. that, that you just gave. You know, if, if you go out and look at Google and, and oh, take yeah. a look at their source code, they're actually using HTML5 too. Now, of course, they've got a lot going on on their site. But but they are you know definitely an an adopter of 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 the HTML5 uh, technology. But yeah, getting back to your to your question, um, we we've seen we are seeing a lot of adoption, especially in the academic market, of of right. uh, people picking up um, on the HTML5 technology. And of course, these are going to be the people that are developing the websites for commercial uh, usage in the future. So. You know, yeah, it's interesting because let's see, YouTube is owned by Google, right? So they're they're right. going in various different sorts of, you know, ways with HTML5. Well, so here's this difficult doc type that uh, that we were mentioning earlier. So you know, in the past, James, we've seen the doc type statement to be a, a, a the declaration uh, type statement to be very long, basically specifying out what language our page is in, and that's important for accessibility. It's important for validation. It's important for search engine optimization. All this good stuff, and and it's quite descriptive. But but in in HTML5, how do I get started? Let's just get started by using the unified doc type, um, and and there it is, doc type HTML. And that's all we need, basically, to start down the path of coding our work, uh, uh, creating our framework, so to speak, uh, to H HTML5 standards. And there's actually a lot of talk going on about um, right now, you know, depending on where you're looking and, and who you're talking with, about dropping off all of these version numbers, you know, XHTML 1.0 or 2.0 or whatever it's on the horizon, or HTML 5 or 4.01, and just get down, everyone focus on the nitty-gritty. It's HTML and, and, and just dropping any, anything relating to versions and just for uniformity's sake from now on, just calling it, we're coding HTML and then, you know, progress from there. So, you know, just an interesting sidebar. Uh, so to speak, off of that. But yes, for for just getting started, simplified doc type. Yeah, I love that. I because you know, we have an exercise in Web Foundations Associate, right, where you can go in there and and you have to type the doc type up, or or you could copy and paste it. But one even space that's wrong, right? In the in that. Just the whole thing and, off. <laughs> Yeah, nothing validates. You you get a Christmas tree of errors, you know. But in this case, see, they simplified it, and that's why we, Stephen and I were joking about how difficult this is. So that's one of the first uh, interesting steps that they've taken with HTML5, and I, I'm excited about this. just that alone. <laughs> Very good. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, next, let's, so we've got some basic page structure uh, to look at. So you'll notice at the top there uh, uh, how we start this document out. And so we not only make it easy, but uh, so it just kind of makes it easy. So let's take a look at this uh, structure. Stephen, what do you got to say about it? Uh, first of all, let me get my magnifying glass out so I can read the slide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I apologize about that. It all scrunched together on me. Uh, but, but basically all I was trying to do here is just show a basic framework for page structure and how this is really going down the track. You know, in the past we've talked about how XML is so descriptive of the content. Uh, you know that that we're providing on the page, and then we've then we talk about CSS, where we're talking about you know adding more structure and layout uh, function to 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 the page. And in HTML5, we're we're kind of combining all of this technology together, and we're really providing a cleaner uh, page structure, a more a more defined structure that will also help coders coming back in on the back end and being able to to read it. So let's take a look at this. We've got our doc type HTML. We've got our normal HTML tags, our uh, container tags, which still encompass all of the material on our page. Our head section, uh, our body section, and then notice we've got a header, um, a header element that's in there. 
and we are going to use this header element to basically be the header of our page. So we're going to contain you know whatever information we want uh, to display at the at the top section of each of our pages on our site, our logo, our company information, um, the the title of our site, whatever we want to put in there. And this is going to be a container tag. Um, again, just kind of helping to to divide the content to be more descriptive. Um, about the content that we're actually using. And then we've got a nav element that we can have in there. And this will, of course, be uh, contained where we're going to have our navigational elements. Um, again, this is um, improving things on so many different levels, um, including accessibility, to, to improve the quality of, 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 of accessibility clients, to be able to render the, the content and, and, and the page, the structure of the page. So we can include some navigational elements within our nav element, and then we're going to actually divide our page content itself into areas referred to as sections. And so we can use a section element that will actually uh, divide some of our content. And then we can have a footer and, of course, our body and, and closing. And, and now, James, you know, we can move on and take a look at some, uh, uh, you know, what some of these uh, elements are on our next slide. So these are our, element, our, our elements. The header uh, element, uh, again, container for introductory information on the page. The navigation for uh, uh, controlling navigational uh, components for our site. Then the section is going to uh, basically uh, group content, um, uh, create sections for content for a particular type of topic that's going to be on the page. And then within that, we can actually refine the placement of our information uh, even more by using an article element, which is going to have individual components or stories or, or content for that particular topic that the section is addressing. And you know, this could be a this could be a blog entry or something like a like a newspaper or magazine article uh, that's that's uh, defining or talking about one specific topic. And then there's this other element called the aside element, and this could be for setting aside, or, or excuse me, for for setting information off to the side, like like a sidebar note, um, or you know an inline footnote. Um, but again, we're able to um, have that you know specified out. It could be formatted uh, however we want using CSS or or inline um, formatting, and then our footer. Uh, element, which is pretty much just what it, just what you would imagine or expect from a footer. But the thing about with HTML5 is we get to have, we could have multiple footers, so that you could have you know different type of content displayed at the bottom of each page of our site. We may have a standard footer that is that is at the bottom of every single page on our site that has you know text-based navigation and our copyright information and things of that nature. But we may also have another footer um, for particular areas of our site, such as products or customer support or something like that, that might have just specific information to that particular area of our site. So some some Good information about you know being able to structure content on our page, James. Well, what's exciting too about this is that the, you get this basic page structure, and anybody who knows HTML sees that these are new and different things. And what's exciting about this, oh, the overall, the big picture, this opens up your page for programming and the semantic web. And and by that, you can because you can now start describing your information, you can place it in interesting ways as a designer, but as a programmer, uh, and as somebody who knows that information, very valuable information is found inside of these pages, you are now tagging that data so it can be used by applications, you can use it for databases, you can use it in other pages and put together a presence that has extremely high SEO value and has extremely high value for your company in terms of intellectual property. So all of these specifics, Stephen, that you've been talking about are making uh, you know, Tim Berners-Lee's vision uh, of what HTML can do, can do a reality, you know, finally, you know, after all of these years. Absolutely, James, and there's a whole long list of different types of semantic elements that can be placed within uh, the actual content uh, to help make that, uh, to make that happen, um, even more so more than what we've got time to actually present today.
Yeah, we don't have time for anything like that. But and what we're going to do with uh, this next element, the canvas element, is really focus on you know the design aspect right now. But uh, but Steve, what Stephen has done, uh, what you've done, is done a very nice job of explaining how a web page has the ability to not only position content but describe it very well. So HTML5 kind of grabs the best of the design world and the best of the XHTML kind of programming world and sticks it all together. So well, let's talk a bit about the canvas element. Um, so using JavaScript, you can draw images on a page, basically on the fly, right? And um, so canvas is, is rectangle in shape, and you control the size yourself. And so you can draw paths and boxes and circles and add images. Stephen, tell us a bit more about this. Well, this is, this is actually a new element for HTML. It's, it's not a new technology. It was actually introduced by Apple for uh, the Mac OS. Um, uh, for the for their dashboard in in uh, Mac OS X, um, and and has even been brought into Safari and 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 into Chrome um, uh, browsers. Uh, but it, but as you mentioned, James, it it allows us to to create or have more control over how content is going to be displayed um, on our page. You know, so for if we're for making navigation or for we're just modifying images. Um, so that it's in, in these are going to be vector graphics, so that they they can actually be uh, more versatile um, on our site. They are held, as you mentioned, to a, to a rectangle um, rectangle uh, in shape. Um, so you know, being able to control them, and and you're not able to just go out and you know whip out your pencil and just start drawing in there. We we have to define this out using JavaScript. So again, enhancing skills as a designer. You know what you know some of the skills that we need to be focusing on, obviously coding, but then obviously uh, the be a um, good no foundational knowledge of JavaScript as well. That's right. That's right. Very good. Now, um, let's take a look then at some of the specifics of the Canvas element. Here you start with a, a simple document, and then you get right in here um, to the Canvas element, which basically defines the rectangle uh, itself. Exactly. So we're, defining, we're defining out a rectangle, uh, 200 by 100, and we're going to put a border around it. Um, you know, a very slight border. And just for this example, it doesn't have to be obviously. Um, and and then of course, if the browser doesn't if the browser doesn't recognize the particular element, it's going to ignore it, and it's just going to display some content so that somebody would see what's missing uh, from them. I'm sorry, James. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, it's all right. And so it's very good that HTML5 again, as uh, we learned uh, in a previous web webcast from Ashley Craft, uh, 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 that HTML5 does a pretty good job of failing, uh, 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 failing gracefully. Gracefully, so yes. So that's what that, yeah, what that text basically does. And so, uh, Stephen, let's talk. Then, uh, go ahead and tell us about how we go ahead and define the shape and the color. Okay, so basically we're gonna we're gonna put in some script. We're gonna put in some JavaScript, and we're actually going to in in this example nothing more than make another shaded box inside of our our drawing area, just so that we can see that how it's actually done. We're we're creating we're creating a um, a variable, and we're going to um, spe uh, specifically draw. We're going to define it as a as a rectangle, and notice in our last line down there, our fill rectangle, we've given it uh, specific coordinates for the size of that rectangle. And then we can even go on and further define it um, using the fill style uh, for you know a specific color. And in this case, you know, we've we've used our our color for uh, blue. Basically we've 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 drawn out, so to speak, a a rectangle on our web page. And inside that rectangle we've created another rectangle. We've drawn, so to speak, using JavaScript a blue rectangle that's inside that box. Okay, uh, James, let's take a look and see what we've actually that, created. That, so here comes the uh, result, result of the uh, previous code that we just looked at. Okay, so here's our result. Ta-da! Our super, <laughs> our, our wonderful artwork. Um, I, I've never been claimed as, as being an artist, so you know this is this is about the extent of my artistic ability. Um, well, actually, my next example is is the extent of my artistic ability, but it, it gives you an idea of basically how we are actually using code to be able to go in and create um, uh, create um, graphics on our page. Now we've seen, James, that this is all code too, 
And in in my right. simple examples, I just used you know some 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 basic text. But now in our next example, we can okay. actually see. Uh, we're gonna, well, Stephen, I just wanted to point out something really quick. What's kind of clear is, is you'll notice the elegance of the the way in which this JavaScript is inserted using HTML5. I mean, not only does it have capability that we've not had before, but that's not ugly code, if you know what I'm trying to say, Stephen. I mean, it's, it's something that you just put right in there. Um, it, it's a really elegant way to go about and get, uh, you know, a, a simple example like this, but also a very sophisticated example. I think that's that's one thing that HTML5 has brought us. That's, that's new and different. And of course, James, you know, you can preload this as well. You know, that your, your, your uh, images that you're drawing out could be preloaded in the head section. You know, we could run our script in the head section, so it's preloaded. We call it in the document. And and you know that's even more refined, so to speak. I would I would say too. Yeah, very good. Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, there's this next code here that you wanted to show. Okay. Uh, so so yes. So in my in, in in our next example, you know, this is nothing more than again we're drawing our box, our our simple box. But then I'm inside that box. I'm actually pulling in another image. Okay. And and again, this is all text based. Um, and so, you know, what does that do for us as far as being able to, you know, uh, help us a little bit um, with with some search engine optimization? For instance, if I'm using my, if I am using pulling in an existing image, um, I could have, you know, the the path for where that image is. And of course, if that is using descriptive terminology for a particular type of product that I'm that I'm I'm specifying, you know, such as such as uh, my Cathlon cookware. You know, I may have my image in in the cookware folder and my image as as uh, Cathlon 14 inch dot uh, pm illustrating. And so, you know, here again, you're going even further as far as helping describe the type of product that we're doing. And of course, we do this very similarly if we just had had a had a picture in there um, of uh, of of the pan and had it. Correctly identified with alt tags and things of that nature, but but again, we're we're doing our part, so to speak, to kind of improve things just a little bit. Um, but as we can see here in our script, we're doing basically the same thing, only we're telling uh, using our JavaScript to actually pull in a new image and what the image source is, the the the, the image that we're bringing in, and then we're specifying out you know where that image is going to be placed in the in the box in the rectangle that we've drawn. And so we've started it out at, at our upper left-hand corner. Okay, James, let's take a look. Ta-da! My, my artistic ability has now reached its max. Um, but, you know, there, if, you know, think about the different types of things that you could be doing in here. Bring, you could bring in multiple images within this uh, particular area. We could begin to define an interactive navigation um, in, in this area. So there's, there's a lot more that you can actually do with this, but the canvas does provide the basically a background for um, content that we can have on our page. And of course, our canvas could be uh, a background image for our entire page if we wanted it to be too. So there's a, there's a lot of versatility in actually being able to control what goes on um, in that background or, or in on the canvas um, as, as we need to start talking about. Well, very good, very good. Well, let's talk about using uh, Stephen HTML5 video, which is the, the, the nice thing about it. It doesn't require a plugin. You got quicker to load. It's less taxing on system resources. Much more available on um, and supported on on mobile devices. Uh, you do have to have a browser that can do it, right? You have to the the programming becomes innate or native to the browser, right? And and that's. That's the whole thing, James. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we can actually think, well, it's an MP4 video, right? Or, or you know, it's 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 this other video format. But you know, when you really think about it, when we talk about an MPV4 or, or we talk about um, uh, an, an a .mov file, you know, these are actually container files, very similar to like a zip file. And inside that inside that container file, we actually have other video. We have our, our multimedia content, um, and 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 that's what the big thing is: is those video files, those audio files, and and what they can what they can uh, be rendered in or, or understood in, interpreted 
by the particular browsers. And of course, our two really big popular ones are H.264 and um, Fiora. Um, as far as the actual video uh, file formats, but inside that MP4, in, excuse me, inside MP4 and inside .mov and, and whatever else, those are container files that are going to actually contain video data and audio data, and, and possibly even multiple tracks um, of those. And and so it's a big thing as far as how do we actually get a browser to recognize recognize those types, okay? Now, because those are containers, uh, you can name files within them that are then available to SEO, the I, uh, to search engine optimization uh, uh, algorithms, is the idea that because you have more descriptive use of your media, it's then easier for you to score higher with your pages that have multimedia? Exactly, James. There's, there's, there's a lot of talk right now. Um, you know, is... Is HTML5 better for search engine optimization? I don't know. We're still yeah. weighing in the facts on that, but you're exactly <laughs> right. The content that's within those files is very descriptive um, for the video itself. Um, and when you look at when you look at a, a flash video, so to speak, you know it's still treated uh, as as a um, um, graphic, right? I could say as, as a near graphic, right? Right. right. Absolutely. And so it's it it, it does become a big uh, it does become a big issue as far as um, uh, what can actually be uh, the value that 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 multimedia actually brings out within um, search engine optimization. But you're right, um, uh, descriptive uh, by nature. It's at least a step that allows you to go in and describe all your resources and uh, you know do again meta information. That's what SEO is all about: describing what you're doing, and and uh, and that's what uh, HTML5 you know at least promises. So uh, uh, this next uh, slide basically is describing uh, what codec and what containers uh, are available to what browsers. So you can see some nice iconography here with Internet Explorer, start, starting with that, to Firefox, to Safari, to Chrome, uh, Oprah, uh, and moving on. So Stephen, tell us a bit more about the, you know, the support that we have here. Because as we'll see with HTML5, there's kind of di varied gradations or levels of support from one browser to the next. Exactly, James. What, what we've seen, as you, can, as you can see in the graphic here, uh, pictures worth a thousand words, and all of these are our newer browsers. Uh, we, we've got our browsers or our platforms, delivery platforms, and then the version number uh, that is supported for the different types of, of video content or or, or um, uh, containers. And and you know, WebM is is you know a new player to the game um, that is you know has the potential for a kind of uh, uh, you know becoming a standard, um, but it's still really relatively new. There is not one single standard video file format that is absolutely accepted on, on every platform right now. So when we go to uh, talking about implementing, implementing a, a video file format, HTML5, what are we going to use? And and this is why this is call uh, has has received the biggest type of uh, issue. Um, it, it's a wonderful tool to be able to implement the video directly within our our, our web page coding, but how and what format are we going to use so that it's recognizable on you know the delivery platform? And even though even though that we can see that all of our modern browsers, our newer browsers, our today browsers are being able to support you know some sort of video. Yeah, that's right. I was talking to some students uh, uh, last week, uh, and they're saying, you know, what what codecs you know are supported? You know, what's supported? And my answer was yes, <laughs> because there's just so many, you know. Right. Uh, and it's the, and there's no one that you could choose. You know, one is well, you know, if you could pick one, and I'm I'm more of an you know open source sort of person, so that's the way I would go with you know maybe see you know. C or WebM, but you know H two sixty four, of course, is a great one. But I so let's take let's uh, take a look. Yeah. Oh, here. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> I'm just gonna say, you're okay. Fine, so we've got a video. We've got a video file that we want to include in our HTML code. How then right. do we actually insert the video into our HTML five page? Oh, first of all, okay. 
Yeah, I let's forgot. talk about I jumped this ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I jumped yeah, no ahead. Worries, dude. Um, converters. How do we get video into one of those formats that we were just taking a look at in order to um, include it within our page? And there's uh, several video f um, uh, converters that are out there that will do just that. So we can pull video, for instance, directly off. Uh, off uh, I could get video that I took last week off of uh, from the BPA conference off of my phone and and run it through the the Miro uh, video converter, um, which is an open source uh, application. Download, install it in either my Windows or Mac um, platform, and then um, I can convert this into one of the uh, web ready. Uh, formats that we were just looking at um, on our previous slide to get it into a format that I can stick into my uh, HTML5 page. Um, Handbrake is is another really popular. Um, uh, Firefox is is plugin for Firefox, um, obviously, which which lets you uh, do it directly on the fly. Um, I like all that of one. these. That's one. All, yeah. all That's of great. these are open source products. Um, handbrake can actually be used from a GUI interface or from a command line if we want to batch process video files that we currently have into um, into a, a, a compatible video format for for uh, our HTML5 conversion. So these are definitely tools worth taking a look at, and and as I mentioned, they're open source. So to me, the price is right, um, and and the support's <laughs> available for them. Okay, now that's let's cool. take a look at getting... oh, just before you just before you go, Stephen. Now, now I get to cut you off, dude. Okay, um, go. Uh, just before you go, uh, make sure uh, because there's so many choices of video that you have. Uh, what you have to do is figure out what your audience is, and the majority of your audience. You know, what product will they be using? That way, uh, you won't surprise anybody. So uh, you can do lots of conversion. That's the easy part. So just find out what your audience wants, and you'll be covered in terms of the, the particular product that you want. So back to you, Stephen, about inserting this video. No, that's a great point, which we'll actually even going to, going to talk about a little bit later on. But that is a great point. You know, it's all about understanding our target audience and what technology skill that they've got, what type of browsers are they going to be using, um, what what support do they have. So absolutely, and of course, you get that by talking with your stakeholders and 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 the customer um, for the project. Uh, so how do we get a video into HTML5? We use a we use the video element obviously and we give it the source and then we can define the area that we want our video to play in uh, looks very familiar James doesn't it um, almost like um, hmm, inserting an image uh, doesn't it yeah. and it's, a, it's 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 the same it's the same basic syntax uh, that that we're going to be using and so this is this is just an example we've got a controls attribute which allows us to be able to put the video controls uh, actually into the uh, uh, tell the browser to to insert um, the the video controls for pause or you know to, to mute uh, for audio um, you know to to actually be able to control the video as it plays so there's a lot of cool stuff in here and you could even take that control section to the next level using JavaScript and create your own custom controls for the video. Um, you know what the buttons actually look like uh, for the controls, um, and what type of you could even use an autoplay attribute in there, so that as soon as the video loads, as as soon as the browser loads the video, it starts playing. Um, and of course, sometimes that can be quite annoying, but but you have the ability to do that. Some sites, you know, really like to do that. You go to the page, the video starts playing instantaneously, uh, and that's an example of using the the autoplay attribute uh, in there. So very simple uh, as far as being able to actually insert video directly within our HTML5 web page. Now, the problem with this is we talked about video formats. How do I really know what browser is being used to view uh, my web page? And so why would I just why would I just want to limit myself to inserting one video file format when I actually have the ability to load multiple video for, uh, file formats. Okay, James. There we go. 
There it is. Um, if we wanted to, as we've seen from the previous slides, you know, we probably need to insert multiple video file formats so that we've got the best bet that whatever browser, current browser, is being used uh, to view our video, that it will render uh, within that browser. And the way we do that is very simple. We use the video element, uh, set our size, and, and, and insert our controls uh, attribute. And then we're using uh, separate source elements for the individual video formats that we've used our conversion tools to convert our video into each of these formats so that we have them readily available. And, and we put that in there. We use the type attribute to basically specify the uh, video uh, file format that, that we're using uh, for the codex and you know specifying the specific codex. And we let the browser do the choice. The browser will recognize the codec that it is going, the, the video file format for its codec that it's using, and it will play, it will download and, and play, render that specific file format, and it will ignore the others. So this is a really uh, unique little trick for actually implementing the video uh, with, within our page so that we get the best bang for our bucks, hopefully with, with a supporting browser. Awesome. Love that. Love that. So um, as you've seen here, uh, in breaking down the code, you have the video element where you can su supply the height and the width. Each source element specifies a single video file. And then the browser, again, will download the video that it supports. Great. Now, on our next, uh, you know, so when it comes to uh, older versions, uh, browsers check the type attribute. You can fall back gracefully to Flash if the browser doesn't support HTML5. And Flow Player is uh, uh, something that you can use that allows you to nest an object element into the video element itself, which is a nice, nice little add-on. It sure is, James. Just like you were saying, it's allowing us to fall back gracefully. If we've got an older version of, of uh, IE uh, or, or some other browser that's, that's not supporting it, then, then this is it. It will, it will detect the, the browser type and, and, and use Flow Player to actually you know, go back and basically uh, uh, use a Flash version um, of the video. And, and we, we're going to embed that directly within our code also. That's, that's, that's up next. And away we go. So this is kind of fun little. Uh, there it Tell is. us a bit more about this, Stephen. Yeah. Well, this is this is basically just like what we were doing um, mm -hmm. on our on our last uh, last slide. Only in the the area that's shaded in gray. That's where we're, we're that's where we're putting in our failsafe uh, mechanism, where we're going to include um, access to Flow Player if the browser cannot handle the uh, the other video formats. It's basically going to use Flow Player to basically come in and and download and play the video as a flash file for us uh, with, within our browser. Fantastic, fantastic. So what we've got uh, next is basically the idea of moving on from video to the idea of offline storage, where you can save something for later. Uh, and in, in some ways, it was kind of based on cookies, but it's much more advanced. You can save up to 5 megabytes storage per website of information, and the browser will cache this information uh, and applications and various things when online, uh, but then we'll use them, uh, be able to use them later on, and we'll store them locally on your hard disk. So it's pretty exciting stuff, and what you can do is that the, uh, the web browser reads a file called the manifest file, and it contains the, uh, a list of the files that your browser will download for offline storage later. And these, these uh, files uh, can be various types of applications that you run, JavaScript applications, uh, et cetera. And so uh, as your user then goes up to try to uh, access pages while offline, those things will still be available. And the, uh, and the <clears throat> user can access uh, that information. So here is a very simple case, a very simple example of offline storage. So basically you have on your left side the scuba.html file. And uh, notice that there is an HTML um, tag there. And take a look at the manifest equals scuba um, 
quote scuba.file. That should say scuba.manifest. That's a typo on my part, folks. That dot .file should not be there. It should be scuba.manifest. Every file should uh, that is a manifest file should end in dot .manifest. So the rest of it is a very simple uh, scuba page. And the whole idea is that there's an application that is telling you at 95 feet how long you can stay down there uh, safely. And the whole idea is that this page is something that can be used offline because I've used a scuba.manifest file that contains a listing of applications that are cached or, and filed. So the scuba.html file will be cached. So will the scuba.css, the cascading style sheets file, and so will that JavaScript file, the scuba.js one. So those will be, be able to be used by an end user even if there is no network con <coughs> connection. So that's what the cache section has to do. The fallback section has to do with uh, a, an HTML file that you could create just to say, hey, look, you're offline. Uh, nothing is available. Something went wrong. It's a nice little message so that people aren't given false information or, or anything that's misleading or uh, so that people are aware that there's a problem. Another section that is available in the manifest file is the network section. If you see that, what uh, uh, I've included there is an info.cgi. That there could be, for example, something that you're using uh, as a hit counter or as something for uh, as search engine optimization. Now, if you're doing real search engine optimization, you don't want certain files to be counted or included. And what that will do is not be included in the cache, and it will not be counted um, as a uh, as one of the uh, downloads from the page. And that way, you get much more. Uh, accurate SEO information. If you'll notice, too, in that particular file uh, where it says uh, it has the forward slash in front of info.cgi and a forward slash in front of scuba.html, uh, and that, that basically is referring to the root of the web server. So you can actually uh, put, directories, uh, root, uh, put directories in there to uh, specify uh, certain files that you want downloaded or not. Really now, saves the time uh, of having to download the entire website so that I could go back and look at it later, doesn't it? That's right. It's just something that's done on the fly because, yeah, we've all seen and done this before. You know, oh, I'll save it to my hard disk and all that. But there's always something that goes wrong, and there's always some application or some uh, uh, bit that is not properly downloaded. And now you've got that taken taken care of on the fly for you. Uh, one thing that HTML5 does very nicely is it takes uh, the forms that are available to you. We all know about the radio object and various objects, and gives you much more robust. Uh, ability for forms, and uh, there's, time really doesn't allow us to go too much into this, but um, you'll see that there's uh, various, and the same input types, but you have search, and URL, and email, and color, uh, and number, many others that allow you much better uh, forms, and you can see some examples that I've put onto the left-hand side of the page. And again, more descriptive in nature as far as the actual content type. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's what's really cool about it. It's easier as programmers. It's also, um, but the results that you get visually are just far more appealing than the, the old forms that we've been dealing with for the last 15 years or so. Uh, geolocation is another interesting sort of approach. Basically, with the API available to you uh, from the W3C, uh, you can basically, uh, uh, with the user's permission, with HTML5, uh, and a very simple API, either from uh, uh, coding from uh, from Google or from Yahoo, and a bit of JavaScript, you can create a page that will basically allow the end user to specify their location. And using Google Maps, they will tell you right what it is. And I uh, went to a site, for example, that was uh, merged uh, uh, through the through the iPhone, and uh, it gave me a nice little. Uh, uh, application that I was able to run very easily, very simply, and it located me right where I was. That is really so, cool. Yeah, yeah. And so these are things that you can put on your page to make more compelling, uh, uh, more compelling content. One thing that I found interesting too is, uh, and Stephen, for example, put a nice list up, and we'll see another one of compatibility. Uh, it lists for for what browsers support uh, what versions of uh, what uh, features of HTML5. I found some pretty good accurate lists. There's uh, Find Me by IP has one, and Can I Use uh, does a pretty good job. But uh, always test for compatibility. Test in all the browsers that you expect for your audience. But there's a nice little site called HTML5Test.com. 
where you can go there and it will uh, with a particular browser and it'll run a little test kind of like a bandwidth speed test as it were and it will give you a score and uh, uh, this particular browser I was using was a Firefox browser out of Linux it gave me 240 points plus nine bonus points out of a total of 400 points the whole idea here folks is that if you really want to find out for yourself and if you trust uh, this uh, website, you can find out what browsers really are able to perform, uh, and that way you're not just getting someone's opinion from some sort of list. You can also go to browsershops.org. Uh, that does a pretty nice job of not only showing some HTML5 support, but does a nice, pretty nice job of on the fly imitating and mimicking uh, dozens of web browsers and browser versions uh, to see how your web page will render. Now, those are really good results. Those are really good results, and, I, and I'm glad to see that your browser performed just as well as my browser did. I got that same score. Off of did you really? Okay. Yeah, I did. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. and you got to be careful sometimes with these sites, right? Because it could be that they have various biases or something's not quite right with the programming. But I was comparing it with other browsers. It looks pretty good. It looks fairly accurate. But you've got a, a nice uh, list here. Uh, from HTML5 trends. Uh, well, and and basically HTML5 trends and basically is pulling in data from um, that HTML5 test uh, uh, engine. Um, okay, so it's it, it's basically using that test engine that you were just using the the, the stats from from that test engine to basically talk about yeah. um, browser support overall. And so again, here's our here's our our desktop browser, so to speak, um, and their the current version. Um, and their um, HTML5 test uh, score. Um, so, okay, just like how you and I got the 240, um, that's what uh, the, the current score from these individual uh, browsers were actually uh, rating in and, and their rank. Um, and, and, of course, you know, some of the, the, the beta versions that are out there uh, for those particular browsers and what their uh, test scores are expected to, to be, basically. Very good, Stephen. Very good. And uh, next, uh, let's take a look at tablets and phones to see uh, whether they support it. So you've got uh, nice Android, right, Stephen? So let's see how you, how yours feature uh, you know fits the bill. Yeah, it looks like uh, there's a. I, I don't know why it didn't line up exactly perfectly there, but um, oh, uh, graphic see. issue. But but yeah, we you know more and more uh, times we're accessing web via mobile devices, and so basically we've got the same thing. Uh, the browsers that are available for mobile devices and their current score based off of uh, the HTML5test.com site and their ranking and and Opera. Opera uh, uh, Mini is is you know right up there at the top, as well as the new BlackBerry browser, which just surprised the daylights out of me. <laughs> me too. My old BlackBerry <laughs> phone, that browser was not worth very much, but um, okay. I, I suppose the new BlackBerry engine is 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 obviously doing quite well, um, as well as the uh, the Mac OS um, for the iPads and iPhones um, came in third. Uh, in back of those, Android uh, came in number four, and uh, Mar uh, Mara, uh, which is um, an another uh, browser engine for for mobile devices. The thing about it is, is that not all browsers support all of the features of HTML5, and that's where some you know, some of these tests come in because it is supporting talking about how do we how does it actually support. So then we got to ask ourselves, James. Now we know something about HTML5. Should we be using it? Um, and and you know, answer right off the top is why not start integrating? You know, let's use our HTML5 doc type for one thing. It's less keystroking, um, but but let's start using you know some of this some of the structural technology uh, to 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 start getting our our pages into shape. Um, and and as as James, you were talking just a little bit ago. You know, know your target audience. What are they using? What type of browsers are they using? What type of technologies can I implement on my page? And then, you know, what about Flash? You know, we, we've seen there's some workarounds about including video in there. But, uh, you know, so should I just stop using Flash altogether? Uh, mm -hmm. Chances are, you know, no. You know, let's, let's, let's you know, what, Flash is going to be around for a long time. It's, it's a great product. There's a lot of different features that, that are, that are, um, that are in there, but there's also a lot of advantages to using HTML5 video within our site. And, and as we've talked about, there's not a single standard video file format that is 
that is out there right now that support it. Yes, we can get plugins for Flash, uh, but then again, there are some mobile devices that don't support it at all. So you know, there, there's issues all the way around. But um, you know, so let's let's start including some of this technology, embed some of these features that are within there. Just be sure that we've got a fallback mechanism in case somebody's coming to us that doesn't have it. And of course, the biggest thing which we've said you know a number of times already through this test your work in multiple browsers. And, and like you were mentioning, James, browser shots is, is, is a great utility uh, to be able to, you know, let you see what type of, uh, what, what your work is going to look like in other browsers. Yeah, when you showed me that uh, back, I think we were in Salt Lake City, it was very hip. So, yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah. Now, when it comes to resources to take a look at, of course, there are thousands or hundreds, at least, of uh, resources, of good ones, about HTML5. We found a few of them. There's Dive into HTML5 that does a, a nice job of uh, describing some of the features, fairly conversational tone. Uh, uh, Mark Pilgrim put that together. HTML5.org also is a good resource. There's a list of HTML5 and CSS3 tools that you can use um, that is available. It's a pretty ugly URL, so I use tiny URL to clean that up. And then uh, there's a website where somebody put together 28 HTML5 features that this person particularly liked, and I thought it was a fairly decent list. And so that's applied to you as well. So one thing that we're doing uh, here at CIW is uh, uh, taking a look at updating. Uh, CIW Web Foundations Associate, HTML5, CSS3, and, and alternative mobile sites uh, for that. We're looking for your input. So we'd like to, uh, you to contact us. Either uh, you can talk, contact Stephen at uh, uh, schneider at certification-partners.com or Jay Stanger at certification-partners.com. And again, everybody will get a PDF of this, uh, of this particular slide so you can get a hold of it. But the whole idea behind this uh, a little committee that we're putting together uh, is to get um, input about wh uh, how we should do it, where we should uh, do the updates, uh, and so that everybody's on the same page about HTML5 and CIW. Well, I think we fairly, uh, so, uh, we, in summary, we talked a little bit about uh, fact and fiction, about what it can really do, uh, some of the HTML5, HTML5 tricks uh, that you can pull, when it, whether it comes to using the Canvas element or offline storage. Uh, we talked a bit about the CIW HTML5 committee. So uh, we have uh, one question, I think, uh, at least on the, uh, on the little screen here, talking about uh, what do you have. Um, uh, well, the first one is how ready is HTML5? And I think it's, it's pretty much ready for prime time and ready to go. I think the one question is how ready is the audience? for HTML5. And for a pure HTML5 play using all the features, I think you could run into some serious problems and compatibility. But as Stephen has uh, uh, said very well, as you start trickling it in and using it uh, in, in smart ways, you'll have no problem whatsoever. So it, it's, your audience will determine it, but I'd say it's pretty much ready to go. There's another question, uh, Stephen, I had to do with uh, when it comes to uh, adoption rate of HTML5 by academic institutions. Uh, we did notice that there were some people in the web design competition at BPA, for example, that were using HTML5. Uh, I'm assuming that that's what we're talking about in terms of teaching, not in terms of academic institution websites. I haven't surveyed those websites. Most of them still seem to be in HTML4 to XHTML1 territory there. But as far as teaching, uh, we're seeing people starting to adopt it. Yeah. You know, James, um, we've we've talked with a lot of people as far as getting this community together. As far you know, in in, right. in, in our direction of of courseware for HTML5, and and we've talked with a lot of people about you know how that direction should go, and 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 everybody was saying you know the feedback that we've gotten is that you know our our, our web uh, uh, development associate web design uh, uh, associate uh, courseware needs to address. Uh, you know HTML5 and, and CSS3 because we're starting to build it into our academic programs, and and you're right, James, that the you know for the for the web design competitions um, for business professionals of America uh, last week, um, there were some schools that you know from across the country that did a really nice job of implementing HTML5 and the backward uh, the the failback um, operations. So that you know you could you could view it in an older version of IE, or you could view it in on on an iPad, 
um, and, and yet still have all of the inter interactivity um, you know, that, that, that you know, the site that HTML5 offered. So we are seeing it more and more in, in the academic market. And within the next year, you know, that, that is just going to uh, proliferate, I believe. Yep, I think that sounds right. There's another question about HTML5 and accessibility, making sure that, uh, uh, you know, what can you do in terms of, uh, let's see if I can get this, this here, um, uh, when it comes to video captioning for accessibility in HTML5, and that's done using the alt tag, is it not? It's going to be using doing the alt tag, but then it also can uh, you can you can develop some some more specific JavaScript uh, that's going to run uh, in the background that will that will assist with that as well. Um, and of course, and then just like any other uh, form of multimedia of addressing accessibility, we need to be sure to include all alternative content um, uh, uh, to supplement that. Yeah, that's right. I've got a, a great question. I think it's from Nicole. Why would an organization choose to, to not to upload video into YouTube and simply embed it rather than using HTML5? Or, or why would we use HTML5 to create a custom calendar when we can embed Google Calendar? That's, that's a great question. Um, I think that there's just lots of choices available to you. Uh, will Google Calendar always be available? What about offline storage, things like that? I think it's one thing to think about. Um, uh, uh, access to it is also um, yeah. uh, plays yeah. a big role. You know, my organization may block access uh, to use yeah. YouTube content, uh, and in which case I'm I'm then hitting a site, and then all of a sudden that content doesn't render for me. Okay, and I think uh, yeah, very good point. Very good point. Um, so I think that pretty much covers a lot of the questions. Lisa, do you uh, do you see any other questions that we'd want to answer? We're we're just over the hour. Uh, you know, Stephen and I we can sit and talk for quite a while, but um, uh, I just want to make sure we respect everybody's time and and uh, see if anybody else has any other questions. Uh, James, there's another question there from Ray Lapine. Um, he says he knows there was no uh, uh, end header tag. Uh, is that a typo, or does the header tag not require a close tag? No, uh, no, that would if the, if that was actually in there, that was a typo because the header tag is a container tag, and so it would need the uh, the, the closing. So that was that was probably a, a serious typo error on my part, trying to get everything to fit on the page you know, on the slide. On the slide, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but but no, the uh, the the header element uh, and the footer element are both container tags, and, and would need an opening and closing. Everything is a container tag, yeah. So that would be done, and then uh, we'll we'll fix that and fix the uh, dot manifest, and and <laughs> we'll get technically uh, uh, the slide ready to go for you guys. So that's good. Well, if there are no other particular questions, Lisa, I think we can uh, turn the time back over to you. But thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, joining in, uh, and Stephen, thank you so much for giving us a uh, run through of uh, the HTML5 capabilities. Fantastic stuff. Absolutely. And likewise, James. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you very much. Well, Lisa, we'll turn the time back over to you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question directly, um, we'll try and take care of those, a few of those offline. Um, and that uh, we do appreciate your, your attendance today and joining us and for your questions. We'll go ahead and stop our recording now.